Today we're going to consider now Hooke's law for plane stress, which is just how do you, which just means how do we relate stress and strain through material coefficients. For simplicity, today I'm going to be using matrix vector notation as explained in class. And so I'm going to write a vector or matrix of stress components where we've got plane stress, the non-zero guys end up being placed in the matrix in these positions. Okay. And because uh, we have these zeros in the matrix because according to our plane stress assumption, sigma z, tau y z, tau x z are all zero. Okay, so this we call this a three by three matrix. It has three rows and three columns. And so we can relate uh, stress and strain for plane stress in the following format. If I take these guys, remember, are equal. So this is what we call a symmetric matrix. So the unique numbers are really just sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. And we relate, we're going to relate those stress components to corresponding strain components. So we have constant out here over 1 minus mu squared. We have 1. So how do we use this? So this matrix vector format is encoding three equations. There's going to be an equation for sigma x, an equation for sigma y, and an equation for tau xy. So if I want to know the equation for sigma x, the way that I read it is it's going to be some constant, e, over 1 minus mu squared. And then I'm going to take basically rho times the column. So the first entry of the first row times epsilon x, so 1 times epsilon x, plus the second entry in the row times the second entry in the column, so nu times epsilon nu, plus third entry in the row times the third entry in the column. And then you can do the same for all three equations. Okay. That's all the that you need to know. It's just a the nice thing about this is that it gives you a very compact way of expressing the equations so that you can separate the material coefficients from the strain components and it gives you a clearer picture of the relationship. We call this a constitutive relationship. And if you go ahead and do the multiplication here to generate these three equations from this matrix vector relationship and look in the book, you'll see that they're identical to what's given in the book. Likewise, we can do the inverse relationship. We can relate the strain components to a given set of stress components. Sigma x, sigma y, 
while explaining. And if you multiply everything out, you'll get three equations, and they'll be the same three equations that are listed in the book. Okay, now there will be times, even though you're in a plain stress condition, that you're going to want to know, for example, epsilon z. Right? How if you have a thin plate and you stretch it, how th much thinner or thicker does it become? This is not captured in plain stress, but we can, if we go back to the full three-dimensional theory, I can write it down, and so you just need to know this. Um, it's just equal to this. So even though epsilon z is assumed to be zero in the plain stress theory, um, if you ever need it for some reason, you can recover it by going back to the all the way back to the full three-dimensional theory, which we don't study in this course. Okay, let's talk about now the last topic here in the course in this section, which is going to be volume change. Okay, so let's consider some parallel pipette, infinitely small, where we have, um, let's see, I have parked there, and some length x naught, y naught, and v naught. Okay, so that has some volume. Okay. And so after the deformations, let's say we strain that, then the resulting volume will be equal to x naught plus epsilon x times the initial length. And then we do the same for y and for z. We can multiply this all out, and it's going to leave us with v1 is equal to v0 times 1 plus epsilon x, 1 plus epsilon y, 1 plus epsilon v, which is equal to v0, 1 plus epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z plus epsilon xy, and so on. We'll consider these guys. We call these higher order terms, and we're going to assume that they go to zero for small deformations, leaving us with our final relationship for linear elasticity, which is just v naught 1 plus epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon v. And then uh, we can call the change in v is equal to v1 minus v0, which is equal to v0 times epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. And therefore, delta v over v0, we'll call this the dilatation e, is nothing more than adding strains together. And so we call that the dilatation. It's really just a measure of change in volume over initial volume. Okay, so if we want to work a simple example here, let's consider we have a thin plate. Okay, we have a thin plate. And um, it's in a plain stress state. Let's say we put a little, this is going to be thickness P. We put a little strain gauge on it. 
and we measure that epsilon x is equal to minus 0 0.00075 and that epsilon y is equal to 0 0.00125. We know the material, so we know Young's modulus is 10,600 psi and the Poisson's ratio is one third. And let's say the thickness is 0 0.275 inches. Okay, so we, the first step we want is we want to find sigma x and sigma y. Okay, we just use Hooke's law. So we have sigma x, sigma y, tau xy is 0. That's equal to... squared times 1 minus 0 minus 1 0 0 0 1 minus 1 2 times epsilon x epsilon y and that xy okay so we have xy is 0 okay so if we go ahead and reduce this, we know this is zero, and we know this is zero, which means that we can reduce this down to just this this problem here. A over one minus a squared one minus one over y, which is sigma x epsilon y. Which then, if we plug in all our values, we have all everything on the right hand side here. We know sigma x then times 4.01 kHz I and sigma y is 11.93 kHz I. Now if we want to find delta T, the change in the thickness, we know that delta T is equal to change the strain in the z direction times the original thickness. But epsilon z is not part of plane stress, but remember there's an equation that I introduced in case you ever need it, and it's this one. So we have epsilon z sigma x plus sigma y. And then you have all that information, so you can plug it in. Thickness 2.4. Fourth. And so now you know you know epsilon z, you know the initial thickness, and so you can plug those in to get minus 6.78 times 10 to the minus 5 inches. So that's the change in thickness. And then for the last step, if we want the dilatation e, we just add up epsilon x, epsilon y, and then epsilon z. Seven times ten to the minus four.